Hello, I am Vinu Keller from Redefine Parenting. I want to welcome you to Spanglish World Network and her network on Zingo TV, channel 250 and 251. Please remember to download both the Zingo TV app on the respective app stores and iOS and Android devices. While you download, make sure to rate and leave a comment. The app is free. Zingo TV is also available on Google Chromecast, Amazon Fire and Fire Stick, Roku, Roku Sticks, and all smart TVs, TVs of 260. 2016 and forward. Today is an amazing day because I have a great guest who's been a friend of mine for many years, and we've both been on this journey together on how do we help people parent? Because there's not one book that's ready for everybody to take on and say, I have to parent this way and I have to parent that way. And one thing I love about Jeremy is that we see things the same, we see things differently, and we see what works for our children. And we're both parents and we're both parent coaches and um, we're both authors. And so it's a great pleasure to have Jeremy on today for us to have this great discussion on. And I know he doesn't like this word trigger and he'll talk about that in a minute. And why do our kids trigger us? There's a lot of insecurities we have as parents that we see in our kids that trigger us. Sometimes we see something that a wound or something that we haven't resolved in our life. And all of a sudden our kids are acting that way. And it's like, oh gosh, how do I stop that? And the way that we stop it, are we yelling? Are we punishing? Are we making them feel the pain because we feel the pain because we have that mirror in front of us. So this is some of the things that Jeremy and I are going to um, have a look at and talk about. And again, this is our opinions. We're not licensed therapists. We are certified coaches, and we're just going to have a real raw discussion on our own experiences of being parents and as well as what we see with our own clients. So without further ado, Jeremy, welcome to the show, Redefine Parenting. Hello, hello. How y'all doing? It's so exciting to be here. So I've, I've watched the show a couple of times, and I'm like, man, I'm going to be on there. And boom, here we are. You message me. You're like, hey, you got some time? And I'm like, uh, yes, absolutely. I will make the time. <laughs> so I love thank it. you for, for the opportunity. So let's start out with like, I know that when you and I were having this talk, I know that we both understand this. I would love just to start this off of, you know, when I said, you know, we get triggered and yes, we do. And yet you, you had a beautiful definition of why you don't really like that word. Like there's something that's deeper than just a trigger. So why don't we just take a moment and just start the call off, like looking at that. Perfect. Yeah. So, so, you know, we had our, our conversation back and forth and you sent me a couple of things for food for thought. And, and it's not really that I, I like or I don't like the word trigger per se, but I, I see the impact, you know, hypnotherapists and a bunch of other modalities. I, I see the impact words use and in common usage, the word trigger is starting to become triggering because when people say, oh, trigger warning, then people who are prone to being anxious, they, they start to like gear up like, oh, I got to wake out about something. And so, so for me, you know, my model of the world rather than talk about mental health or mental illness, because because those that conversation sort of is a in, in my model, it's a false dichotomy because they're either one or the other. And it's like, well, let's just look at mental process. And when we step back, you know, and disassociate a little bit in a healthy way and just say, well, well, what's the process that's allowing a person to get to certain thoughts or certain feelings or what's true in their model of the world that's leading to certain behavior. And so for a lot of parents, if we have unresolved stuff in our past, then when we see our kids moving through that stuff, a lot of times we'll be associated to it. We will kind of be reliving it as if, you know, it reminds us of the stuff we haven't dealt with yet from when they were, you know, I remember when I was five and this thing happened and oh my gosh, my kid's five. And we might not be fully conscious of it, but we're kind of wigging out about it and like overcorrecting or, or, or over course adjusting or getting ahead of too much. And we're amping all of our unresolved stuff into what the kids are doing. And, and our kids don't know because they're five and they've never done this before. And it's their first time and we're freaking out. And they're like, what's the deal? So, you know, we're going after flies with bazookas instead of fly swatters. Um, I so so I, I like the idea of just reassociate. Like we're reassociating to unresolved stuff more than we're being triggered. Because once you've dealt with whatever the causal factor was and you've resolved the stuff in the past, the trigger has nothing to fire on and the trigger becomes meaningless and it's just information. You go, oh, that used to make me upset, but now I realize. Right. I love and, that. And so that's, that's my frame. Yeah. I love that. Like reassociation. Like I love that. And you know, so, you know, I, I, we get very vulnerable on the show, by the way. So why not now? 
So my daughter is having a challenge right now. And it's so interesting on how it's exactly that it's bringing up unresolved things for me. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I was a young girl and I was bullied a lot, I tried so hard to find connection. You know, mm -hmm. I would ask people questions that I already knew the answer to just to try to create conversation, to try to feel seen and heard. Mm -hmm. And I guess you would say it, that I kind of um, overdid it. Like I was over, I was like so overt, like trying to just put myself there and trying too hard to be mm -hmm. people's friends, right? To be seen and heard. And back then when I go into that moment, I get it. Like I, I understand my formula of what I was trying to do, even though it was backfiring and more and more people are pushing away because they're like, okay, you're irritating. Like, why are you asking that question? Mm -hmm. I see my daughter doing the same thing. Like mm -hmm. I see my daughter wanting to belong so bad to maybe a set of girls that she sees at school or, you know, these friends over here. And um, even in our family, she'll do it, right? And to even her siblings are like, oh my gosh, she's so irritating because she asked the questions that she already knows the answer to. And immediately mm -hmm. I go back to when I was that girl. Mm -hmm. And so what do I do? I try to redirect it and that doesn't work. And so then I escalate and that doesn't mm -hmm. work. And then I'm like trying to give her different ideas and that doesn't work. And it's not working because I'm not seeing her for her. I'm still seeing the little me that right. it's been triggered. And I don't want her to go through the pain. It's right. like, I want to block her from the pain. I want to block her from that experience. Right. Well, the, there's a couple of things you can kind of uh, extrapolate from that. Number one is by going through that experience, look at all of the talents, gifts, tools, and abilities you've developed, right? At the same time, it, it's a crap sandwich. I don't want my kid to eat crap sandwich. Like it's just not fun to go through. And do we need the school of hard knocks? Could we learn this smoother, easier, faster? Right. And and so, you know, more than likely, there's a lot of like, she looks up to you and a lot of your behavior is imprinted on her. And so she sees your model of the world and she's like, that's a really cool way to be. And so you're kind of filling that hero archetype in her model of the world. And, and so she's, she's modeling a lot of that behavior and her copying things you did. It's a way to connect with you, which is great. How does she connect to herself? And it's, it's how do we get ourselves out of our own head to not take it personal and be curious what story has to be true in your model of the world to make that behavior. Okay. Cause story always drives behavior, behavior Absolutely. always drives impact. So what has to be true? What do you have to believe? in order to make that pattern of behavior the most reasonable, the simplest, the easiest. And, and, you know, you could even, she can still do the behavior, maybe just help her dial it down so that like, Hey babe, there, there's a concept Tom Hopkins teaches when you're doing sales and questioning, it's called porcupine and you ask a question, but it has the way the question is structured. It's for people to answer, but then they throw the question back to you. And so when you're asking certain questions, that porcupine, you may be just beaming it at them and it sticks and they're like, ow, that hurt. And instead of it being a back and forth playful, it might feel like they're being grilled or cross-examined. Mm -hmm. And now it's just, you're out of rapport. So whenever you get that resistance, oh, that's a sign you're out of rapport. So you just need to slow down a little bit, breathe a little bit. And you can you know, start to show her different modalities of, of how to communicate. Like these people, how do they communicate? Where do their eyes go? Body language. So you can kind of like, you know, this is, this is where I go. Cause I start to deconstruct communication patterns and I go, okay, well, how is it that they're, are they, are they talking really fast and they're really excited about the things they're doing or are they really slow and like, right, right. be chill. So you so, can... so what's great is I, I, I did some of this. And mm -hmm. so we've had a success story because now it's like, nice. we've gotten her to kind of reframe it more as a, as a statement of a fact. Right. So mm -hmm. instead of like, is it raining outside? Um, yeah, it's raining outside. So right. now what we've taught her to do is ask the question to yourself first. Mm -hmm. Do you really know the answer? And if right. so, could you make it a statement as mom, can you believe it's still raining outside? Cause that's still getting my attention. Cause that's really what she wants. She's still right. being seen and heard, mm -hmm. but now it's a conversation versus a, I don't know, come rescue me. Let me be a center of attention. So right. by doing exactly nice. kind of what you've done, mm -hmm. you know, this was like, a while ago, we're still practicing that. And so yeah. when it does come up, instead of shaming her or being upset with her, like I used to be like right. a while ago, it's, I connect with her and I'll say, okay, so nice. what's the answer to that question? Right. And then I'll say, okay, so, cause you know, how could you say that differently to me? Right. So right. it's constant practice with taking out the blame and the shame. And it's yeah. exactly what you said. I had to get curious. I had to get curious of what's really going on with her 
and what is going on with me as well to, you know, feel that connection and feel kind of like associated, right? Reassociated, as you said, right? The reassociation. Right. And so I use that example because what Jeremy said is spot on, you know, it's, it's spot on. And, and again, I did it in a very simple way. And now we've been able to basically overcome that. And hmm. now she still feels like she's still part of the conversation right. without feeling that she's being irritating. Yeah. So it really comes to, you know, you and I are both familiar with Tony Robbins and his work and the six human needs. What needs are being met by that behavior? What other way could we get those needs met? You want to connect. Cool. You're asking questions. It's torquing people off. Fantastic. Stop asking questions. Start making statements. Right. Or, or, or man, it's still raining, but gosh, you know, I love the rain. I remember, you know, in, in my personal story, we moved to Saudi Arabia when I was five and, and we had been there for, I think, six or seven weeks, 120 degrees in the shade. Then we went to Germany for two weeks and it rained every freaking day. Everything was green and, glow mm -hmm. and growing and the smell of it. And so for the rest of my life, rain has just always been like, it's an association of just like peace and tranquility. And I love 40, 50 degrees and rain and people are like, mm -hmm. the weather's miserable. And I'm like, nah, dude, nah, this is like beautiful weather. And then I have the story I can connect in. And so when you have those little vignettes that you can share with people, you can build those over time. Right. Mm. And now you can ask them, you know, what's a time when the, when the rain was like, yeah, I'm really curious. What, when was there a time when the rain was like amazing to you or really frustrating to you? And you can begin to have like totally different kinds of conversations. Now, depending on she's in middle school, high school, that'll be a little weird, but college and beyond, that's a great opener to a fantastic conversation for networking. So well, lucky for her, she's 10 years old. So she gets to learn and grow through this. Yeah. Sweet. You know, um, so just want to touch on something for those of you that don't know, Tony Robbins is an amazing life coach. He, he coaches us from stage, I would say, through all his events. And if you go to his event called Unleash the Power Within, he really goes into the six human needs, which is mm -hmm. certainty, uncertainty, which is also variety, loving connection, significance, growth and contribution. So just to give you an idea of what for those listeners out there that haven't heard of Tony Robbins, I would definitely highly recommend um, that was my my, I started there as my trajectory of my personal growth. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, I don't know if Jeremy, you started there, but I know I met Jeremy on that growth um, path mm -hmm. that I was on as well. So just to give some context to what he was saying. So, you know, a lot of our kids need that certainty. A lot of them need that significance, especially their worth. You know, um, I've, I've written this book on teach your children that they're enough because if we as a parents can give them that foundation of their worth, how will they start showing up in their world, right? Outside the home and in the home. So moving along about this whole triggering path that why, why else, why else could kids really, you know, um, make us associate to something. And, you know, I know that Dr. Shafali had a video about this and she actually talked about, you know, a man not feeling um, masculine mm -hmm. or emasculated. And then she, he saw his son, you know, being kind of feminine and then, you know, taking it out because it, 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 again, associated, I like that word better, associated him to back when he was a child and how he didn't feel masculine. And, and I mean, I do see that as well. I do see mm -hmm. that these, again, I think it comes back to what I was saying before about the wound. What's your idea about that? Yeah. So, so in that particular example, we've got a dad who, when he was younger, was more effeminate, was more more feminine expression, was bullied for that, worked through it, pushed through, you know, got himself through it, blah, blah, blah. Now his son is playing soccer and he, has, he, sees, he sees his son being more effeminate and he remembers the pain he went through. So now he's trying to drive his son away from that, trying to force his son to quote unquote man up and, and drive more of that masculine behavior. And, and so for the dad, you know, as I as I listened to the story she shared in my model, I would let, I would be like, well, the dad's still in his feminine because he is he's living in all this 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 meaning which is all he didn't verify anything. Mm -hmm. He's just he's just projecting all of this meaning onto his son, and then he's trying to solve his own problems through his son by proxy. His son might not have those problems because the world's a different place now. We're in a different society in a different period, and the way masculine and feminine behaviors are expressed and associated, it, it's all changing. Right. Mm -hmm. And so dad is like upset about, well, my son's going to have these things and, and, you know, not being able to interview the dad. How does the dad actually feel? Well, I love my son and he's so sensitive and I love that at the same time, I'm worried because, you know, it's a tough world or whatever his right. story. But, but what I saw from the description, 
the dad is projecting his unresolved experience because for most all of us, we're not all masculine or all feminine. We're some ratio and some, some events and situations. Yeah. It's not all, you know, pokey out people this and pokey in people that and boom, it's done. No, people are way messier and monkier than that. So like get over it. And, and so maybe for his son, he's just a more sensitive, nurturing provider type of masculine. That's just his son. And that's who he authentically is. Right. And maybe by helping his son to just be who he is and have the confidence to own that, dad can find something for himself instead of I have to suppress this so he doesn't experience the pain. Because we so, don't know if he's going to experience the pain. Right. And so just playing off what Jeremy's saying is like one of the strategies that I would share with you that are listening is that if you see this going on, if you see that, you know, that association to your child and you don't like it, number one, get curious. Like you guys know every show I always say, be curious, not critical. So get mm -hmm. curious about it and ask yourself, what does it mean for him to act that way? What does it mean for him to be sensitive? You know, and get to know your child, ask them what it means to them in their life. Absolutely. What if they're, you know, feeling this part of them that is more sensitive and compassionate? Like our, my husband and our, we have twins, the 10 year old twins. And our boy, he's he's really emotional. And we don't make mention. We don't label it. We don't title it. It just is. He's a person who feels. He's a compassionate kid. And that's what we do. We play on the strengths of it. And we say, nice. wow, how compassionate it is. He's really knows Absolutely. how to feel. And we have helped him now mm -hmm. to really unpack what those feelings are versus, oh, he's so emotional. Oh, this, oh, that. And I'll tell you, when our children were... Um, had to do some testing for their dyslexia and ADHD, the therapist told me that the licensed psychologist said, you know, 25 years of evaluating seven-year-olds, because they were seven at the time, she says, I've never, ever in my life seen two seven-year-olds that are so emotionally um, grounded, like they know their emotions and they know mm -hmm. how to express them and they know how to basically unpack them. Nice. And I said, well, it's what we've done with our children since they were, you know, able to have the emotion and be responsible for the emotion. Like when they've gotten right. to twos and threes and, you know, starting to have those meltdowns to express, I'm not happy. Something's not comfortable. I'm not understanding why you're saying no. And look, I have this opportunity to have this behavior. So you see what I'm doing. Right. And we've always told them that you can have this behavior and own it. And when you talk about it, we will. And so we create their room as their safe space to this day. If they're having a challenge and they're upset, we said, you may not disrespect us and yell at us. What you can do is say, I am upset right now. I need some time. And then when you're ready, you come and talk to us. It just happened this morning, actually. And mm -hmm. my son went up to his room and we knew he was upset. He was stomping. That's his like little pattern that he does. Literally two minutes later, he comes down and says, I'm ready to talk about it. I say, okay, tell me what was going on. And he's like, I was upset because I didn't feel like I was able to speak and that, you know, dad was saying this or you were saying this. And I said, okay, so what can we do differently? Because mm -hmm. now we're teaching them ownership. Correct. Now is the time it comes to ownership. So I rather focus on that with my child who's oversensitive than mm -hmm. labeling them going, oh gosh, he's going to be too feminine. Like they're. Yeah, they're yeah. But, but, but even oversensitive compared to what? A brick? Right. <laughs> I mean, what Good are we comparing point. this to? Because there's no absolute in human behavior. There's a giant, huge range. Yeah, I, th I think of it like quantum states. And there's like, when you, when you study quantum chemistry and, and quantum mechanical stuff, it's like, well, the electron is here 90% of the time, but occasionally it's wonky and out where we didn't expect it. And when you start to live in that field of probability, it's like, well, usually kind of in this area, but not always. And, and so, so you've hit on something really key, I think, that we want to bring forward to the audience. When you are in a very strong emotional response to something, usually there is some level of judgment. And whenever we're judging, we kill our ability to stay in rapport, which destroys our ability to influence. If you are judging someone, you cannot influence them other than through force, threat, intimidation, through violence or, or implied violence. You're not going to have influence, right? I can get things to happen. I used to do birthday parties uh, in my Kung Fu school when I had it. And I'd have these kids I don't know. And within an hour and a half later, I'm making a mess and they're racing each other to clean up my mess. And the parents are looking at me like, how'd you do that? And I've got anywhere from five years old to 15 years old because well, we're in rapport, because I made it fun, because I caught their attention in a different way. I speak to them in a way most adults don't. 
So I'm doing a lot of these little things to build rapport with them. Always easier with strangers, by the way, always harder with your kids because you have expectations. But whenever you're judging, you kill your ability to influence because you break rapport. So I would offer, instead of judging, evaluate. And that's how you stay curious, which is what you said perfectly. Stay curious by evaluating. I see what you're doing and, and I see the impact and I don't think it's getting you where you wanna go. That's really interesting, fascinating. What, what leads you to that, that process? And, and just, you can kind of put on your, your disassociative hat for a second and this, whatever behavior your kid is doing, there's a reason for it. Human beings are always reasonable. Even if it's the dog made me do it, that's a reason. So we got to find what's the reason. You understand the reason you can begin to change the reason you change the reason, AKA story. You will always change the behavior because, right. because they have room to breathe because they have room to exist when you don't make your kids wrong for where they are, but you can say, that's not okay. Hey, I love you, but this behavior is not okay. Take a deep breath. It's okay to feel what you feel, but that's not an excuse to yell and scream and throw things at the cat. The cat didn't do anything. Right. Take a deep breath. It's okay. Right. You know, and then what we would do is based on the age of the kid, you've got, you know, Autumn, or Evie is uh, seven. So she's got seven minutes. Like go up to your room. You've got seven minutes. Then we'll, we'll check on you. But just you've got seven minutes. Just chill out. Take a deep breath. Get back to center. It's cool. You're allowed to be upset. Mm -hmm. But what's going yeah. on? What what drove that? It's all dominoes, right? And when right. you figure out what the dominoes are, just pull a couple out and things don't explode anymore because you can interrupt the patterns. Right. But we got to identify it. And that's where our strong emotion is because we're jumping from the beginning of the pattern. We're jumping to the end and it's going to mean for their whole entire life and they're going to be... And it's like, hold on. <laughs> they're five, they're seven, right. they're 15, yeah. breathe. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, I when I used to work with families 23 years ago and I was learning in school and I was doing my bachelor's degree and there's like this, the, you know, the, the, the right way to do it, right. Textbook way, you know, best practice is what they would say. And it was like, you know, per minute of like give a child like their age per minute. And mm -hmm. it was interesting because I learned to get away from that. And I learned how my child can regulate his own emotion that, you know, at two at three or four, who am I as his parent to say, you only, you have four minutes to regulate, like let him have as much time. If he needs two minutes, if he needs one minute, if he needs 10 minutes, yep. you know, like today he's 10. He literally, like I said, came down two in minutes. less than two minutes yeah, and it, it, he was ready no. to process it. Yeah. And I think we give him that independence of learning how to self-control. It's mm -hmm. learning how to say, I am in this emotional, you know, bubble, if you would. Yeah. And now I'm ready to, in like deflate it. Like, how do I deflate it? And, right. and we've done things like we, we have different things that we do in our family, especially for our son who tends to be more emotional than his twin sister, you know? Um, but great points, great points about letting that child have that moment to just mm -hmm. take a breath, you know? And we also, one of the things that I just want to touch on is we got to get to the cause, like the behavior, Always. the meltdown, that's all the effect. We Correct. need to get to the cause of what's creating that. What is so going on so much in them that they're having that such a behavior. So, mm -hmm. but we'll say that for another show. I want to go back to the whole being associated or triggered by our kids. Yeah. Um, another opportunity why I see, you know, working in with families for, you know, 25 years or whatever it is now is that a lot of parents also, not all, but there are a lot of parents out there that feel that the way their kids behave or what they do is a reflection, reflection. on mm -hmm. if I, am I a good parent? Am I a good mom right now? You know, um, <laughs> yes. and, and it's like, you know what? We do the best that we can with what we know Absolutely. in our lives. Yeah. Well, Hey, is the cord cut? Oh, okay. So they're their own person. Oh, okay. Correct. <laughs> like and immediately, I, like I, I had to do that with my wife. Cause yeah, occasionally she would just you know, be upset. I'm like, Hey, Cords cut. They're their yeah. own person. It's it's theirs. And 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 I I feel like I personally got to understand this at a deeper level because um, you know, Jeremy, when I met you, my I was a single mom at the time and I only had my two boys and mm -hmm. they were in their, you know, young and teenagers. And now they're 28 and 23. <laughs> so um they keep getting older, by the way, not us. Just yeah, them, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just them. Just them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when they became their own person and they became adults, and my oldest one's married and he has a daughter who's almost five, mm -hmm. I realized that if I am not taking responsibility for the choices they're making as an adult, why was I taking responsibility of the choices that they were making as a child? 
because mm -hmm. when I remember this one time specifically, um, I was married to my kid's father at the time and my son was in kindergarten and he hit a girl and he came home and my ex-husband, he was livid. He was like, what? You don't hit girls. And he just like flew off the handle emotionally. So we mm -hmm. have to ask ourselves, why is that a reflection on us? Of course, that's what we were feeling. We're feeling like, oh my gosh, what are people going to think about us? Do people think that we're sitting here hitting people and whatnot? Because we don't do the spanking method. Mm -hmm. um, that's not our way of disciplining our children. And so, but he, my son got a spanking and I was like, in that moment, and I had no idea of what I know now, I was like, how is spanking our kid for hitting someone else going to resolve it? Well, and I'll show you bigger violence for the violence you perpetrated. Correct. And so scare I scare like, you into not being violent. It was so not aligned with me at the time. And yet I was still also learning and growing. And what I realized is it was that reflection on, oh my gosh, are we bad parents? Because our child made a choice. Now in our home, they never got spanked. In our home, we didn't have violence. Mm -hmm. We didn't watch violence. So we start to go through this index, right? Where was it my fault? Not one thing we did was our fault, but yet nope. as parents, we were still shaming ourselves. We were still Correct. taking on like, oh my gosh, I'm a bad parent. So fast forward now, my sons are 28, 23. They make choices. Maybe it's a speeding ticket. I'm not taking responsibility for that. Mm -mm. Do they know not to speed? Yes. Have I taught them not to speed? I mean, we're going to chat. We'll, we'll, we'll shelf that answer. <laughs> five miles over is not speeding. Right, right. What's five miles? What's and five miles? If I'm not taking responsibility now, then I can't take responsibility now with my younger ones too. It's allowing them to know, here's the guidelines. Here's, here's what we teach. Here's our values in our home. We mm -hmm. actually have a theme in our home and it's love and kindness. Mm -hmm. And so we teach this, we breathe this, we talk this, we do this. And mm -hmm. yet when my child goes outside this home and they make a choice not to live within that love and kindness, not to live within the values. It's their choice. That. Yeah. And you know what? They're going to grow from that. Yep. And yep. thankfully it was a small infraction. Correct. Versus because I, I, there's a friend of mine runs a martial arts school and they have, I met him, I think he was 16 testing for a second degree black belt, but they had a kid who in the third grade stabbed another kid in the eye with a pencil. And the kid who did the stabbing is in the martial arts now mm -hmm. because the parents went through and went, wait a minute. For our kid to do this, is that because he felt safe or is that because he felt threatened? Mm. So he didn't have confidence. So he resorted to violence because he had no other way to assert himself. So I met him at 16 testing for a second degree black belt. And part of his test, he held his arm out to the side and they took a, they took a, like a rake handle and they smashed it over his shoulder and shattered it. He didn't move. And they did the same thing on his thighs. They broke a two by four on his thighs and he didn't move. And it was the idea of the resilience, the strength, the confidence that I can take things and it doesn't bother me. It doesn't affect me because I have something bigger and stronger inside of me. Mm. So they went into that behavior and he's afraid. We need to get him not afraid. We need him to have confidence. And so they went into how to have other ways to handle so that violence isn't the only way to power. I can use my words. I can use my force of presence. I can just use my body language. There's so many ways to express power when you have it. But usually the people that resort to only one expression is because they don't believe they have any other forms of power except violence. Mm. Yeah, so it's like we, we got to give you more agency intelligently and in, in, a, in a social boundary, right? In a code right. that, that there's a time and a place and it's only, I will only fight to protect my life and the lives of others, not to and get I, my way. And what's great about the way that parents handle that. So the parents, what I'm hearing you say is not like, oh my gosh, we're bad parents. They're looking at the action going, okay is he afraid mm -hmm. and he needed to protect that behavior is you know? not okay what made that okay in him right. and let's fix that exactly and so yeah. and that's really what we want to tell our listeners is like yeah. how do we get out of being triggered from our kids associated to something that they're doing whether mm -hmm. you feel it is something that you see in yourself that's not taking care of a wound whether it is you feel it's a reflection of your parenting you mm -hmm. know i've said this before on a different show is that you know, I, I had a, a client that I worked with and she had the opportunity to meet my kids. And, and she's later on said, she goes, oh, your kids are not your walking, talking business card. And at first it bothered me. Like I was really like <laughs> triggered, if you would. I'm like, what, yeah. they're not, they're not. They're and not let perfect. Me tell you my, my growth now, 
my growth now is they're absolutely not my business card. They're my children. They're my children that I don't coach, that I love and I guide. And I use, I do use the strategies I share with my clients when I'm coaching them and it works. And that's why I use them. Yeah. But your kids are going to have their own opinions. Correct. Correct. Strong parents raise strong kids. Duh. Hello. You know? When your kids push, when your kids push back on you, is that because they're disrespectful, or is that because they're trying to communicate their model of the world forward? Right. And right. So I just want to help the listeners that also don't understand model of the world. So we all have filters, even our kids, and every piece of information we delete, distort, and generalize that information. Yep. And because of that, whatever our filters are, our values, the way we were raised, the way we see the world whether it's influenced by social media, our friends, our family, TV, the music we listen to, the stuff we watch. We have influences every day in our life that create that filter. And it's through those filters that we create how we see the world. So it's that rose colored glasses theory, right? right. So you put on rose colored glasses, you see the, the world differently, take them off, you see them differently. So right. when we're talking about filters, and I've heard you, uh, Jeremy, use it quite a bit. I just want you guys to understand that our kids too, have their model of their world at their age. And knowing that the brain does not develop until they're 25 for girls and 28 for boys, we also have the ability to influence our children in their younger ages when we are able to understand their model of the world, which Jeremy was just talking about. Yeah, so and, and well, it's like when I, to give you an example, when I was a kid, um, we moved to Dayton, Ohio. I was in second grade. I had already lived in Turkey. I had already lived in Saudi Arabia. I had already been to the reclining Buddha in Thailand. I had already been to uh, Snake Castle, which I think wow. is in Greece. I'd already been to Italy. I'd already been to Spain. So that was my experience. I had been in more countries than most of my teachers in Dayton, Ohio at second grade, mm -hmm. eight years old. So I had a much more expansive world model. You know, my, my awareness of the world around me was much larger. I had a Kung Fu brother that didn't get in an airplane until he was 26 years old for the first time. I had been flying since I was six months. Mm. So you know, the whole what's normal, normal right. is a setting on the dryer. Normal doesn't exist. Right. Because none of us have, there's no one standard human experience. We all have unique things. And so model of the world, it's, it's my perspective. It's my take. Like, I don't, I don't do a lot of I'm right. I don't do actually any I'm right. I have a perspective. And I won't say when I'm right, but I'll say when you're right. And I won't say when you're wrong, but I'll say when I'm wrong. That's a covenant I make with my clients, but it's also the way I operate because I don't know that I'm right. I had that opinion a lot, a lot long, you know, when I was younger and I was a lot unhappier. I just have my perspective. And I can argue and I can reason through why I have this perspective and we can have that conversation. But I'll never say I'm right because I don't know. Right. 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 This is, what, this, is, this is what I know. This is what I don't know. This is what I know. This is what I don't know. Like, like, dude, I have some ideas and they seem to be pretty cool and pretty solid. They work really, really well. But yeah, I, I take my clients room. through a process too, where I say, you know, you know, it's right when you get the right uh, response that you want or the right yeah. outcome that you want. And, yeah. and the other thing is that like understanding that, um, you know, if we stop wronging our kids for the way that they are and we start appreciating them for who they are, <laughs> we would have a better connection with our children. And, you know, through Redefine Parenting, I had created a video, six week video course called Crack the Code to Parenting. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's week two, there's a whole video on letting go of the baggage, letting go of our own baggage as parents mm -hmm. in order to parent. And that's where I got the idea of redefine parenting. Mm -hmm. Because I can say for me, I was a parent at the age of 20. Mm -hmm. And I have birds, four kids, and I have two stepdaughters. So total, I have six kids and a granddaughter. And I will say that there's never been one ideology that I've ever lived by for my children. I parented my first set of kids, <laughs> my first set, that's crazy, but they're adults now. <laughs> in a way that I was parented. You know, I said that mm -hmm. I wasn't going to yell. I said that I wasn't going to ground. I wasn't going to punish. And that's exactly what I did. And the reason why I said I wasn't going to do it, because it didn't feel good to me. It mm -hmm. just took things. It took my worth away. It made me feel like I was never good enough. And right. yet I didn't know any other way. So I got comfortable with this way. And I was getting the results I wanted for my kids, or at least I thought I was getting for my kids. Right. And now, because God gave me a redo with my twins, 
my husband and I do it totally different. We don't punish, we create rewards. We hear them, we understand them, we ask them questions, we get curious. And mm -hmm. why did I do that? Because I let go of my own baggage. I let right. go of what I felt or what I thought parenting had to be in order to get, like we were saying, the right results, the perfect results. There is no perfect because right. I will admire my child for however they want to grow up. If they want to be a cheerleader, be a cheerleader. If you want to be, you know, in choir and you're a boy, then be in choir and you're a boy. Let's rock it. Like whatever you choose to be, be the best you. And that is what I had to realize is getting out of what society thinks my children should be, what society thinks my parenting should look like. And I need to be the parent that my each child needs. If that's a conscious parent for that child, if it's a helicopter parent for that child, all my children have different personalities and different needs. And right. I will be the best parent I can be when mm -hmm. I can identify how to connect with each of them. Yep. So it's letting go of that baggage. It's letting go of your perception of how parenting has to be. And it's opening your mind and the ability to see your child to what their needs are at that moment. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's exactly what you said, what you need to give to your kids, give them understanding and acceptance. Well, guess what? The more you can give that to them, then you can give it to yourself too, because you can't Bingo. give what you don't have. And, and that's how you start to interrupt this whole triggering process. Because what is triggering? Triggering is a situation is occurring that I don't have the internal resources to manage or regulate. And so my nervous system goes ape bonkers and my words go crazy. My body goes crazy and, and just everything goes kind of wonky donkey technical term. And so when we start to understand, we start to accept, we start to, we start to stop the judging, then it starts to take the tempest back into a teapot. It starts to slow down the processing because, you know, I, I'm thinking of a specific situation, um, where I know your know, family has an autistic daughter and mom gets really, really angry, really, really fast, really, really upset. But the daughter is a visual communicator, mm -hmm. right? Like, like, so when she gets upset, she runs and hides her face because she doesn't want to see what's being said. So she'll run and she'll hide her face. But mom is a very auditory. So mom wants to explain and talk. But then when the daughter is not looking at her to listen, mom feels disrespected. But for the daughter, you know, there's there's stuff. There's a bird outside. She's right. listening, but she's looking because she's visual dominant. So she's still listening because you ask her questions and she can answer you and she's back to this. Well, the mom now feels disrespected. OK, well, where else has the mom ever felt disrespected? Because feminine patterns, whenever you feel a strong emotional state, feminine and scarcity, you go back to every other moment in your life you've ever felt the same way and all of it is fresh again. It's like, why do women freak out when the toilet seat's down? Not because the toilet seat's down, not because they can't just look, but because it makes them feel like somebody was thoughtless and careless and inconsiderate. And where else in their life have they felt the same way? And all of that comes back up to consciousness and they're like freaking out and they're angry and they're hurt and they blow up because it's not that one incident. It's just another in a long line throughout their whole life. And so it's like, take a deep breath slow down, take a step back. Did they really mean it this way? Did they really? And then I train, you know, I train my son and myself. Like we always, when we pass a bathroom, we look as the toilet seat down because we just build disciplines to not have that fight. Duh. <laughs> it's like, dude, just, just, you know, but for her, for that particular mom, she has a very strong style of communication and her daughter is diametrically opposed. And so it's like, well, I can make the four-year-old wrong or I can learn their communication channel. Mm. It, it, either one's a choice. But right. if I'm gonna if I'm gonna make my child wrong for how they communicate, and then I'm gonna hammer on them, and I'm gonna give them pain, I can begin to predict where we're gonna be in ten years, and that child is now fourteen and has been made wrong for how they communicate and how they process for the last decade. I can tell you where your relationship is going, and it's not gonna be a healthy one big happy. No, it's not. Absolutely so, not. So suppressing them that's one strategy, but it's gonna lead you somewhere. Versus, well, you're the adult; you could understand them. Right. No, I, I totally hear that. And, you know, and again, it's looking at if your child is making you associate, like going back to like my daughter and asking those um, questions where she already knew the answer. And when it triggered me, what it made me realize is that was something else that I still needed to work on. Like, mm -hmm. don't be afraid. Like my, I tell everybody, my kids are my biggest lesson every day. I mm -hmm. see something in me. I realize something I have to do. I can do better. Because every day I'm making better than it was yesterday. Like that is my morning question. How can nice. I make today better than yesterday? Nice. And so 
being open to see what shows up in my day. You know, did I get so frustrated today? What, what was showing up that I got that way and what can I learn from it so I can be better? Mm -hmm. You know, letting our kids, as much as we are there to guide them, allow them to guide you, especially right. now in the world that we're living in. You know, there's so much going on. There's so much conversation. Mm -hmm. And if we want our children to understand openness, the conversation needs to start at home. And we, it has and to, we be, have to be open. Exactly. Without judgment. And yeah. so, you know, it's interesting because when you were saying that, you know, I coach, I've coached thousands of people over the last 20 something years. And I will say if I had to ask, like, if somebody said, what's the number one challenge children face today, I would automatically say judgment. Mm -hmm. That's, that's their challenge. Judgment from their parents is number one. And surprisingly enough, judgment from their peers is number two. Mm -hmm. And some people will say, well, don't you think they're peers? And I'm like, no, when I ask the kids that I have coached, they're more in fear of the judgment from their parents mm -hmm. than they are in fear of the judgment of their peers. Right. Why don't we see that? We don't see it because a lot of us have worked, our kids go to school, they do it. And then when they have the problems, it's social problems, it's not problems at home. When COVID happened, we got a brand new lens, if you would, a brand new filter mm -hmm. of what's really going on with our kids. Yep. And I don't know about you, Jeremy, but my caseload like tripled during COVID. And, and I, when I would talk to the parents, it was like, we had no idea and we were still seeing it as social anxiety and not knowing how to connect. And interesting enough, as I coached, I got to the cause and the cause was always their worth and like not disappointing their parents or mm -hmm. not letting their parents think this or think that because then their parents are going to see them this way. Yeah. That was the number one thing. So if, and you know, you've said this so elegantly before, in order to inspire your kids, to teach your kids, to encourage your kids, to influence your children, you have to let go of the judgment. Mm -hmm. Ask them what meaning they're giving. And I love this quote, and I'm sure many, many mentors have said this, but my mentor, Tony Robbins, has said this. Nothing has a meaning, but the meaning you give it. Mm -hmm. Same with your children. So another strategy I would offer the listeners today, when you get curious, when you give your child advice, take a second and ask them, what did you hear me say? Find out through their model of the world, how did they hear it? to make sure it's an alignment of what you are teaching, guiding, or saying in that moment. Mm -hmm. Because that is also one of the biggest disconnects I see with parents and their children is that they give a direction, their kids say, okay, the parents said, did you hear me? They get a yes, <laughs> they come home at five o'clock and nothing's done. Right. And now it's World War II again. And yep. the kids are upset because they did what they heard. They, they picked up their clothes from the bathroom. That's all they oh. heard. Oh no, I've got a picked up story for you that was awesome. Oh. So so I have I had a family in my in my Kung Fu school. We've got the, the the whole family's in the program, but I've got a lot of tension between dad and son. And and so they had a situation and the son is just living like a pig and he's a slob and all this stuff, all the judgment, right? And so mom and son are just at it all the time. And dad comes in, and he's like, Look, I'm sick of this. I'm tired of you and your mom fighting. Um, that's it, I'm done. Pick up everything in this room. And I'll be back in an hour. I want to see everything picked up. And dad leaves. Dad comes back an hour later. The room is the exact same. And dad blows a gasket, yelling, screaming. I can't believe this is the type of person you are. You just want to get in trouble. You don't give a two about anything. And I mean, dad's just ripping in. And the kid sparks into his anger. And he goes right back at his dad finally. And he's like, what are you talking about? I did. I did what you told me to. I picked up everything. And he goes over to the couch or he goes over to the to the, uh, the, the the side of his bed. And he grabs this thing and he picks it up and he puts it back down. See, I picked it up. And dad, because I had been hammering on dad about some things, had a flash of realization. They were still dealing with a child brain in a 14-year-old body who's literal minded. Mm. I picked it up. And dad laughed. And he's like, okay. You have an hour one more time. I want everything put away. This is what I want it to look like. This is how I want it to be. Mm -hmm. I want this this way. I want that. That when dad went through this whole big litany, left, came back, and he had exactly what he asked for. But it was because mom and dad had been parsing their meaning, pick up your room, and the kid had been picking up and putting down everything. 
not put away, <laughs> not clean up, not dust, not vacuum, not keep it out, you know, get your closet organized, get it nice and tidy. Like, like they weren't using the words they were using. The kid was listening to the literal container, but he wasn't being an obstinate teenager. He was still functioning in a child's literal brain. Mm. I heard the word you asked. I did the words you asked. Mm -hmm. And it was yeah. like this giant flash of realization. Oh crap. The words I'm using matter because I'm creating metaphor and imagery with the words. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, calibrate, adjust, dial. I love all that because that's exactly it. Kids are very literal. You know, yeah. their brains are not, you know, they, the frontal lobes not developed until they're mm -hmm. adult. They don't have the executive functioning. They don't have the reasoning that we have. They don't see the long-term consequences that we I would, I would say, I would say they get flashes of it, but it's not consistent. Like it hasn't fully turned on, but there's, that's why they drive us crazy sometimes. Cause like you were so good yesterday. What is the deal? Why well, today are you? And it's like, well, cause it linked in yesterday, but today it's just not, it's, it's wonky, exactly. Wonky. So it's because firing enough, off. that's what our frontal lobe does. It gives us that long-term yeah. understanding of like, this will happen long-term if I do this. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm being, I'm certified through Dr. Amen as a brain uh, trainer. And, mm -hmm. you know, he says that this is why teenagers need us. We as parents are their frontal lobe and basically we need to help them have that executive function. We have to help them understand because this helps their brain grow and mm -hmm. have the understanding. So when their frontal lobe is fully developed, it's yep. with the, they have the reasoning, they have the understanding, they have the executive functioning yeah. of how mm -hmm. they have been trained. And it's funny because a lot of people will be like, well, but no, my kid understands like, don't touch the stove. It's hot. I'm like, because they have a physical reaction to it. Like they, they, right. they get it. And, and it's a, uh, like a, a, they're trained because they're a creature of habit, if you would. Right. So, right. And when you start getting into strategy, it's all ephemeral constructs of the mind. Right. So it's a concept called laddering. We just, we build our kids a ladder of logic for them to climb until they, it becomes a self-sustaining strategy that they just, they run it now. Right. Yeah. And so that's why I say, you know, ask your kids, what did you hear me say? Feed it you back. Know? The other thing is asking your kids also to say, you know, what is it that you want from this? Like, that's the mm -hmm. other thing is that we just assume what the reward is. We just assume this is what they want and we're not even asking them. And then we figure out like, my kid's lazy. My kid's not motivated. Well, do you even know what your kid wants? Does your kid even know that you're striving for this over here on the right side? They're still way on the left side and you don't know how to get them to match because the kid doesn't have your understanding. So. Right. The communication, and it's again, critical. that's where one of the parents, like a lot of my parents say, I'm so triggered because they're so not motivated. I don't want them to be like mm -hmm. my ex-husband. I don't want them to be like their brother, right? So there's a comparison. So the other side, judgment. Take out the, yeah, judgment, right? Take yeah. out the comparison. Mm -mm. Like stop comparing your kids to anybody else but themselves. Right. See what's great in your child and see how to expand upon it. Mm -hmm. Learn mm -hmm. what is it that they specifically want and learn yeah. how to help them achieve it and yeah. don't do it for them, please. Like we have got to start helping our kids be more independent. And, you know, last week episode with my friend, Allison, we talked about how do you raise independent kids? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not being that person to make, to go do it for them. It's allowing them to do it with your guidance yep. in that. And if you really look at all of this that Jeremy and I've been talking about, it tells you that there's no reason to feel our, your own judgment as a parent due to your children's behavior. And if your child's, you know, making you associate from a past wound or something that's not resolved, ask a better question for yourself. Like, what do you need to do to resolve it so you can mm -hmm. see your children through fresh eyes? Yep. See them through fresh eyes. Yeah, the, the key, I use, I use the anagram road. R-O-A-D, because, you know, my name. But we get into a pattern, rejection. Whenever we get rejected, whenever the kids feel rejected, it very easily slides into overwhelm because I'm trying to do a thing and my resources internally aren't producing the result. What's wrong with me? What did I do? And then all the self-talk can kind of drive us. But we get into overwhelm. And when we're in overwhelm, then we slide over into feeling anxious because now we're trying to put our, our minds into the future and come up with every possible permutation of answer, which drains all of our resources. And now we're exhausted and we're nerfed. And so to get back power, we fall into D, which is disrespectful behavior to ourselves or to others. The yelling, the screaming, the temper tantrum, the negative self-talk, but I'm the worst at this, I'm so horrible. And that the antidote to all of that is acceptance. 
But acceptance doesn't mean roll over. I can accept something because then now I can influence it. I can accept that my child is upset. I can accept that my wife is frustrated with the situation because then I accept the reality of that moment. That's when we become powerful to become an agent of change and do something different. But when we resist that feedback, when we resist our kids being upset or we resist whatever, that's where we start to make our lives more complicated because now we're, we're fighting against the inertia of the moment right. versus just go, this is the deal. Okay, right. I can handle this. And we step in, now we become powerful. Whenever we right. step back, like we're, we're putting the brakes on it, but we're also taking ourselves out of power to impact what's really happening. So breathe and step in and accept it and then go, okay, this is happening. And now what am I going to do about it? And then I love you can drive it. forward. Mm -hmm. I love it. So can you just go over those again real quick? The yeah. ROD? So R is rejection because it's the first thing. Something happened and nope, nope, that didn't happen that way. That's not real. That's not okay. I, I don't like that. I don't want that. Whatever the type of rejection. But when we reject, very often it drives us into overwhelm Overwind. because now it's, it's, what does this mean? This didn't work out the way I wanted. It's not happening. It's not. And so we're in, in our heads with all this overwhelm and that very easily slides into anxiety or anxiousness because now we're putting our minds out in the future. And because that went wrong and because of that, I have to come up with every possible answer for the future. And we're like every possible way it could go wrong and come up with strategies and answers and counter answers. And we're burning resources. So we feel disempowered. And then eventually we end up in disrespect to ourselves or to others mm -hmm. internal. I'm so stupid. I'm so dumb. I'm the worst. We tear ourselves down. We make ourselves smaller to justify the rejection or we disrespect other people. We make them wrong for their rejection of us or our gift or our offering. And well, you're the idiot. You're not nice. And you're a poopy head and you have stinky breath. And so we disrespect them or we disrespect ourselves and we can add drugs and alcohol and, and, right. cutting and a bunch of other behaviors into quote unquote disrespect. But the antidote to the whole sequence is acceptance on the first piece and go, okay, that didn't work out the way I want. What do I need to do different? Right. Cause acceptance doesn't mean just roll over and be a doormat. It just means I've realized that actually happened and now I can step into it. So, okay, what do I want different? How right. could I, how could I, and you begin to change your questions. Why is a question that will keep you an overwhelming anxiety? Yeah, I don't, we don't use what, why. What and how, what do you want? How do you want to get there? Right. That's always a more powerful strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, you know, I've, I've discussed this on other um, segments too, is take out the why, why put somebody into defensive mode, you know, and that's, yep. we, we can go on a whole nother tangent online and everything else with that word. Why? So yeah, I, that I'm was right amazing. I, I love that ROAD. That's mm -hmm. so good. Um, you know, so we're going to just wrap it up. We have about another minute. And I just sure. wanted to say that, you know, instead of getting associated to what your kids are going through or triggered by it, I'm going to say, I think that overall thing that I've heard from Jeremy and myself say today is get out of judgment first. If you're not judging, are you really going to be triggered? You know, what are you making it mean? You know, what do you start evaluating? Mean? Evaluate. And That's the key. Yeah. Be curious, not critical. As I've always, always said, Love be it. curious, not critical is my mm -hmm. motto for almost every show that I have here. So, you know, Jeremy, we have like one minute left. If you wanted to give one golden nugget for parents to really take home today, all the listeners that are listening right now, what would that be? Appreciation. Because whatever you've got going on with your kids, they're freaking here. And more than likely, they're an answer to something that you've been asking for a really long time. And sometimes they fade into the background. We take them for granted and we drive forward. And sometimes we have to. But when you can really appreciate the opportunity, the challenge, the moment, the biggest difficulties give us our biggest growth if we're willing to step into it. So when you appreciate it, it's easier to stay in the acceptance. It's easier to stay in rapport. It's easier to be influential. Nice. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for your time today. And as nice always, pleasure. as you come and listen to my show every week, Redefine Parenting, you will also be able to give your child a childhood they won't have to heal from. This show has been heard on Spanglish Radio Network. Please check out www.spanglishworld.ca for all your news and programming. Spanglish World, watch it, hear it, read it, download it, and live it. Love.